Welcome back to Jugoscopy TV. Right now I have Ugo Panizza with me from the Graduate Institute to have a look at public debt. So welcome, Panizza. Thank you very much. There's more and more empirical literature that shows there's a negative correlation between public debt and economic growth. Now this does not exactly imply causation. So what does imply, what does actually cause it? What causes the correlation? We don't know. Maybe it's the low economic growth that causes high level of public debt. Maybe let me give you an example that has nothing to do with debt and then we get back to debt. If somebody comes to you and tells you, well, I noticed that there is a lot of correlation between being sick and being in a hospital, therefore, I know that going to the hospital makes you sick. You say, well, you know, it might be the case that going to the hospital makes you sick because, you know, when you go to the hospital, you're exposed to all sorts of bacteria and viruses. But if you're telling me that you have the proof that going to the hospital makes you sick just because I observe a lot of people to, in a hospital, I say, well, that seems a silly argument because I know that actually sick people tend to go to the hospital. So it might not be the case that going to the hospital makes you sick, but it's the case that when you're sick, you go to the hospital. And that's the same thing about public debt and low economic growth. First of all, we tend to measure debt as a debt to GDP ratio. So when we have low economic growth, the GDP tends to be low and therefore the ratio goes up just because the denominator goes down. And moreover, when there is low uh, GDP growth, uh, you tend to have lower tax revenues. Therefore, again, for a given amount of expenditure, debt tends to go up. And you tend to have uh, more expenditure in sort of uh, social insurance or unemployment benefits, all these things, what is what are called automatic stabilizers. So it may be the case that this correlation within debt and growth is driven by the fact that this low growth that causes high debt. Maybe, we just don't know. The only point is that just observing a correlation does not necessarily imply that it's high debt that causes low growth. It could be the other way around. So we need to find uh, ways to sort of disentangle the origin of, uh, of this correlation. And what are the policy implications? The policy implications of our, of our research is that since there is no evidence that uh, debt is bad for growth, we should be careful in implementing policies which have the only aim of reducing debt because these policies might turn out to be counterproductive and instead of stimulating growth they actually uh, damage growth even more. So here there is a, a lot of tension between what you should do in the short run and what you should do in the long run. So in the long run it's clear that you want responsible policies that uh, produces do not produce deficit in the long run, that hopefully reduce debt in the long run. So that's what you want in the long run. But in the short run, being completely fixated on debt reduction, but actually may actually end up reducing aggregate demand and more, do more damage than good. And in fact, if these policies shrink the economy very much, they actually you might end up with a recession and with higher debt, exactly because it might be the low GDP growth, which might lead to an increase in the debt to GDP ratio. And Pranitza, what are the costs of default and how do defaulting countries actually suffer? Okay, so first of all, let me just separate the first discussion from this one. When we talk about the link between debt and growth, we usually think about advanced economies. And most of the recent dis discussion on focus on advanced economies. All what we know instead about the cost of defaults has to do with the experience of emerging market countries and less with the experience of advanced economies. Of course, it's very much relevant for advanced economies now uh, because of the case of Greece and Cyprus and hopefully no other countries. But the experience, the empirical experience is fully based on the experience of emerging countries. So what do we know? Theory tell us and what the data tell us. Theory tell us that when you default, you are gonna suffer enormous pains, that nobody will be willing to lend to you anymore, and if they lend to you, they'll ask very high interest rate. Uh, it tells you that people might stop trading with you and all this sort of stuff. What actually the fact tells you that the cost of defaults is fairly low. In fact, we find that this capital market punishment, this loss of access, only lasts two or three years. Defaulters after three years are basically the same as non-defaulters. Uh, the decrease in trade, there is something, but it's very small. The economic contraction that happens around a default, again, tends to precede the default rather than following the default. So again, it's very hard to find cost of defaults. 
uh, it might be related to the fact that countries tend to default too late and therefore in a sense they pay the cost of default before defaulting rather than after defaulting. And why do politicians and bureaucrats go to great lengths to actually postpone what is pretty much inevitable? It's very hard to say why they do it. There might be two possible reasons. One reason that has to do with good politicians and one that has to do with bad politicians. So let me start with the bad politician story and then I'll tell you the good politician story. The, the bad politician story has simply to do with the fact that we observe normally that politicians and policymakers, so the governor or the central bank, the minister of finance, tend to lose their job after a default. So if you are a self-interested guy who cares about keeping his job or her job, uh, you're going to try to delay as much as you can an event which is likely to make you lose your job. Even though defaulting would be the best thing for your country, would be the best thing for society, you're trying to push this uh, uh, far away as much as you can so that you can keep your job as long as you can. So that's a story with bad politicians, bad policy makers. There could be another story. So in the literature on, on sovereign debt, there is this idea, so what I told you before, that we don't usually observe big cost of default. And there is this idea in the literature that maybe defaults which are justified, defaults that are unavoidable, are not punished very hard. While defaults which are what the literature calls strategic, that is, I'm defaulting, I have the money to pay you, but I'm defaulting just because I can, you know, because sovereign debt is not enforceable, you know, it's not like regular commercial debt in which I can go to a court and try to enforce a sovereign debt, country is sovereign, I cannot enforce it, so I just tell you I don't pay because I can. So, so this, there are some people that say, well, you know, we don't observe big punishment because defaults are always necessary. If we were to observe strategic defaults, that is strategic, I just default because I decide that I don't want to pay you, then we would observe large punishments. So if you have a good politician and you know that a strategic default would carry a very large cost for society, you want to give all the possible signals that your default is really necessary, it's not strategic. And the best way to signal this is to go through a huge amount of pain and then at some point say, listen, you know, I tried everything, there's nothing else left, and therefore I'll default. In the sense you, you would punish your society in sort of to avoid a bigger punishment. Uh, these are two theories which are equally valid, they're non-testable, so I cannot tell you uh, which one is the right one. I think that it's a mix of the two, actually, the truth. Thank you very much, Benito. Thank you for inviting me. Well, that is it for right now, but Panita will be back in the studio to have a look to see has finance gone too far and is it actually damaging to growth? But for now, goodbye. <laughs>